Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 16 of Galileo Conquest, and we join, well, we join with the Grand Viking Funeral off the launch stage of Sister Assumpta. Yeah, these things, uh, of course, return to Gale at rather high speeds, as you might imagine, speeding through the atmosphere and falling towards the surface and usually plunging into many, many, many pieces. Sometimes little bits survive, but they are but a bare memory of what once was. As it happened, the transfer window for Tulumo followed on very quickly from the previous mission, so we're heading out there with a new spacecraft called Sister Imelda. Now, this was supposed to be very similar to Sister Assumpta, but unfortunately I only realised after I'd launched it into space that I'd accidentally forgot some important bits and pieces. Nevertheless, the launch is very similar to the previous uh, probes that we've been sending out. It's exactly the same rocket, mostly the same body. The only real difference here is that I wanted to make sure that the solar panels extend out a bit more because we're going to be going away from the sun this time rather than towards it, therefore the amount of fuel, the amount of power we have available may be significantly lower. Now, we're still not sure what we're going to find when we get here. Judging by the map, it looks like there's a ring system, and that's as far as we can tell from our telescopes. The telescopes are not powerful enough to really let us know what uh, secrets Tulumo holds. We're going to send this spacecraft out there, it will collect more data, and then we can think about sending a crewed mission to this mysterious ringed world. Anyway, we're just circularizing this orbit right now, bringing the, the Apple apps up, and in fact overcooking the whole thing so the upper stage, or sorry, the first stage, actually goes into orbit. Therefore, we decide to be good citizens and apply the braking thrusters a little, dropping the periaps back inside the atmosphere. Now, of course, we have to do another flip around so that our upper stage can actually stay in orbit and not fall down and get the good old Viking funeral treatment. So, this does, of course, mean that I am firing my rocket engine just past the spacecraft and hoping that we don't hit it. That was a close shave, but not one that was unexpected. And now, of course, it's another moment of gratuitous re-entry. It's kind of in my financial interest to actually track these stages because sometimes chunks of them survive. Or uh, I'm just more interested in watching some uh, pyrotechnic rewards for my efforts to get things into stage. There is something really nice and neat about having everything neatly fall back to the planet. Especially, as in this case, when they survive completely intact. Okay, we lost the, the fins, but I've no idea how that happened. I mean, the truth is, when you actually take a look at discarded rocket stages which have landed back on the planet, they actually look still a lot like rocket stages in many cases because, you know, they are mostly empty fuel tanks and therefore they're pretty high drag. Also, apparently the first stage of the Black Arrow rocket, the only British rocket to ever launch anything into space, that landed relatively softly and the first stage is on display somewhere in Australia. Anyway, of course, I'm filling you in on this detail to hide you from the fact that I managed to completely forget to record my uh, attempts to set up my transfer orbit towards Tulumo. But suffice to say that we have a pretty decent encounter set up, or at least we have some pretty cool maneuver nodes that will get us very close to Tulumo. Although, at this point, I realize that... Uh, I'm actually going to be orbiting the planet the wrong way. I will need further corrections to fix that, but don't worry, I have plenty of time, and the alarm clock will remind me. Well, speaking of recovered Russian rockets, you might recognize that capsule from my uh, previous science video on the a reusable spacecraft because it is the the VA capsule. I kind of hadn't realized that. I knew I knew I knew the capsule was from somewhere. 
And when I went looking and I found the pictures, I, was, I knew instantly. Of course, that didn't give me the ability to pronounce the name correctly, and I was suitably mocked when I attempted it. But anyway, after my ill-fated trip to CT, we have a new, uh, a new pilot. Jolteen Kerman will be flying Bob Kerman. It's decided to have two crew members and give them a little more space in the form of uh, inflatable habitats to keep them, uh, to give them space to kind of stretch their legs, to move around, to stop them going on strike during critical phases of the mission. Sure, we could have had a little uh, command, you know, probes in there instead, but I figured that Jeltine would be quite happy flying the entire route. So this is a completely new rocket, completely redesigned, and I do kind of like the idea of the upper stage with the inflatable, uh, inflatable habitats. And of course I'm saying this as we have just reached one year of the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, or BEAM, being deployed on the International Space Station. It's a technology demonstrator, very small area that's supposed to, or volume, that's supposed to demonstrate inflatable uh, living spaces. So we're just going to inflate these here. Uh, the one on the space station, they've inflated it, they had a little bit of problems inflating it, but everything seemed to be fine. They have installed sensors on it, but and they can probably use it for storage, but they're not really uh, working in actively. The hatch to the module is closed unless they're actually looking inside it, because there's still, uh, yeah, it's basically a large closet with, you know, padded walls. That's what it is right now. And you know, a large closet with padded walls is exactly what Jeltine wants. I'm sure that will... Uh, that will keep her happy, keep her and Bob happy for the duration of this little jaunt all the way out to City. They're going to take their time a little more. They've got more, um, they've more supplies with them this time. They've got more living space. They've got more habitation. So I think this will be a much better planned trip. This will be the longest trip so far carried out outside the limits of Gill's immediate vicinity. Of course, we have the Klon Rickert station, which is currently uh, testing long duration, but this is going to be traveling far afield, and perhaps that affects the, the homesickness factor. And we, we've made our transfer burn, and it's now just a case of making some adjustments to get us as close to the target as possible. And then setting up some uh, mid-course correction burn to make sure that we get as close as possible to to uh, CT. Of course, the idea is the closer you get, the more you can take advantage of the Oberth effect and the more uh, fuel you can save overall. It's worth noting that unless you pick your launch uh, plane exactly right, you will always have to make one of these mid-course burns to correct for this, simply because... Uh, when you make a burn close to the planet, you're essentially making a burn in a two-dimensional plane. And if your object you're going to is out of that plane, you're going to need a second burn later on to correct for that. I mean, yes, in theory, you can make the plane change when you're close to the planet, but that just would take huge amounts of fuel. This is the best way to do it. Or at least the best way to do it that doesn't require huge amounts of planning. I, I'm just throwing these things out there and hoping that I have... Well, I know I have enough. Hoping that I don't end up using too much Delta V for the capture and the insertion and everything else. So here we are, in orbit of Cite, Jeltine Kerman going where only one Kerbin has gone before. But she has Bob with her as well to keep her company, and we have science to get from the plateaus. EVA data, come on, jump out. You find excitement in the presence of flat areas on this moon, and then everyone else follows suit when they read this later. It's worth noting that the thing that we really lost from the previous mission war were the surface samples, right? Everything else we mostly transmitted back to the surface, so... Um, yeah, we're hopefully going to collect some more data from some more biomes, but primarily we're going to collect more, um, more samples. Some of that sweet, sweet SETI samples, uh, or maybe they're savory, or maybe they're bitter or sour. We don't know because they were barbecued too much and our scientists have yet to get their tongues on them. I mean, I think this is really what this whole uh, Galileo Conquest series is about. It's about putting together a banquet of surface samples from all over 
this uh, Galileo system so that we can serve a suitable meal for the king or queen or the monarch of the Kerbals. Anyway, we've used up the fuel of the transfer stage and now we're going to be very gently landing this in the lowlands by the looks of things. Incidentally, the spacecraft is called Sampras because, of course, it's named after Dougal's Rabbit, which is, of course, named after Pete Sampras, the tennis player, because, of course, rabbits and tennis players, right? Totally makes sense. Now, oh, tennis. Now, there's another thing that I've never done in Kerbal Space Program. Can you build a nice racket that'll hit balls around? Gonna have to try and figure that out sometime. Anyway, let's drop this onto the surface with the greatest of ease, the greatest of speed, the most efficiency possible. Jiltine Kerman showing off her landing skills. Gently does it. Bounces a little, but now we see we have the new science. Why is it this color? Just why? <laughs> Bob, get out there and take some samples. Get some EVA and... Oh, wow. Hey, no, what are you doing up there? Get yourself down, you fond memories this view will not make. Especially since somebody else has already collected that data. Oh, yes, they're dead, so they don't have any memories. Uh, EVA. Ooh. That is all. Uh, you take up a fragment of the dark and oddly colored soil. You find the blend of colors grows up close as from any great distance, but you store it anyway. Plant flag. So yeah, um, I'm guessing we shall pay tribute to the great chariot which brought us here. Plenty of room here. Now, Bob, return from whence you came. We have many, many more places to be, things to do, data to collect, and of course, delicious morsels from the surface of this alien world. Now it turns out I have plenty of Delta V left, so what I'm gonna do is start hopping sideways. The idea is I'm gonna fl fly over at uh, an angle, and when my flight engineer changes his landing biome, I'm going to follow that as a ballistic arc and then very carefully set it down and collect more science from another biome. So, easy enough to do, and the idea is that if I hit a point where I think I don't have enough fuel to make that landing, I can just continue going along the 90 degrees vector, and that will put me on a return journey towards uh, Gale. Towards Gale once more. Yeah, I mean, if I was really caring, I could probably bring up the maps and actually map out some other biomes to jump to. But this is uh, this is just working well enough in this case, and it keeps me without having... It keeps me... It makes sure I have plenty of Delta V. So very gently, we are now at the Midlands, and we have more science to get. Bob, you're the scientist. What can you tell us? Although this place looked like cotton candy from afar, remembering what everywhere else looks like... Bursts your bubble, or soaks your candy. The soft-coloured soil crumbles easily and finds a place in a sample jar. Hmm, that'll be a nice garnish for some space soup, I don't doubt it. And after having placed a flag, it's time to head east once more, looking for new biomes, new untouched, sciencey type things. Highlands! Excellent! The Highlands it is. So yeah, when you're doing these suborbital hops, incidentally, normally I would go with a much lower uh, nose attitude because I'm trying to get to orbit. But when you're going suborbital, 45 degrees is typically the reliable angle. I mean, 45 degrees is the perfect uh, pitch angle for, on a flat plane. And as you get faster and faster, closer to orbital velocity, the ideal deflection gets lower and lower. But 45 degrees is a pretty good guess, to be honest. I mean, you could go with 30 degrees if you want. Uh, I don't know. Honestly, I think it's one of these things that I should do the math on one of these days, because I kind of have an idea about what's good, but I've never actually done the numbers, uh, solved the equations and all that. Okay, and we are at the Highlands. Bobby, 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 Bobby. What are you going to tell me? It's rather bright out here when it's daytime and rather bland when it's nighttime. It's amazing how one data point tells them that. The pale crust of this moon proves difficult to break off peace with your hands. You bet it will, however, easily surrender to your teeth. 
More evidence that we are, in fact, collecting ingredients for the epic Galileo space banquet. For posterity's sake, we leave behind another flag. But finally, we head back to the ship. Yeah, you can see the big hatch there. That That is um, the spitting image of the Soviet VA spacecraft, which uh, was actually reused, but however, it was never developed into a proper, a crewed vehicle, because the launch vehicle, the Proton, kept exploding. It was rather unfortunate because, you know, everybody's going on about how SpaceX are the first company to reuse a space capsule. Well, I guess the Soviet Union beat them to the punch with the whole capsule reuse thing. Although, to be fair, SpaceX are not a giant government. Anyway, you can see uh, just how close I cut it. I have 57 meters per second of Delta V left, so that's not... Well, that's uh, rather tighter than I expected, to be honest. <laughs> uh, if I could have really messed up that last stop, if I had loitered a little too long, I might have not had enough Delta V to get back to the planet, which would be rather embarrassing. But nevertheless, we're falling back here. It's lovely watching this thing spin like a top. Coming down over the poles here, because we uh, came from an inclined orientation, if I, if I had been uh, much more restricted in my Delta V capabilities, I would have probably been more careful with my uh, return trajectory. But now we ditch the stage, we ditch the booster stage with the accompanying inflatable habitats. We shall say goodbye to their padded, co the, the padded, what do you call it, closets. Padded closets where they can jump around and bump around off the sides and have fun while they're floating around in space. It's nice watching them explode and disintegrate in the atmosphere, even illuminating the clouds, they're so darn bright. But none of this is to make it down to the surface. The whole lot burns up and there is nothing left. All that remains is Jolteen Kerman and Bob Kerman, and very carefully wobbling the heat shield off there, deploying the parachute, and watching the heat shield race them down to the surface. It's okay, we're letting you win. The landing's going to be pretty hard. You probably don't want to... Oh, wait, actually, you survived without a parachute. Well, I guess the joke's on us then, right? We could have done that without... I mean, we're not going to try that without a parachute. Okay, seriously, look. We get there. We land. Hallelujah. We have now visited two of the bodies in the Gale system. We have space probes sending to three of them. And we're waiting for further launch windows. We also have collected a whole host of science. And we can actually get a surface sample here. You find the water carries a strong odor and is not fit for drinking. You wonder how the things that live in it live. I too wonder, and maybe we will answer that question in a future episode. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.